everyone. Um, this Can evening's message entitled The Way of the Cross, I could have uh, also used another title called Death by the Cross. Um, but I chose not to. I thought maybe I would just uh, use the way of the cross instead. Um, it is also, in a sense, a continuation of my uh, previous message, which was David and Goliath, a lesson in warfare. Um, there I had talked about uh, the, the warfare of the words, the power of words. And uh, this evening I'm going to continue along with that and I'm going to talk about the power of the cross which is why this evening's message is entitled the way of the cross um, I grew up in Kolkata um, in a mixed religious background my mother was a first generational believer my father was not at that particular point in time um, there are indications to show, show that possibly uh, he did make his uh, peace with God before he passed on. However, I grew up as a young boy, young kid actually, running around chasing butterflies outside because I was too uh, small to sit in so-called main service. They had no Sunday school then. It was later that uh, we shifted um, our home and uh, closer to another church that had a Sunday school and so I grew up going to Sunday school and when I was uh, nine years old that's when I gave my heart I made my own personal commitment to follow Jesus and uh, that's also one of the reasons why I suggested that one of the songs we sing this evening was the last one we did I have decided to follow Jesus that is when I made my commitment not because my mother was a believer, not because I grew up in Sunday school, not because the predominant influence was Christian, but because I made my own commitment. Then I came to find out later on, much later, that the power of the cross is more than just for that time when I made my commitment. So we call it the salvation experience, maybe. All right. Um, many different words have been used. Just let me use simply the word salvation for that moment, that day of salvation when, when Jesus came into my heart. However, I have found that the uh, power of the cross goes even up till today. And I'm going to try and explain that as the power we have against the power of words, which I talked about in my previous message. But the question I had was, is, is it only that power for that one time, that one prayer? That one moment in time when I committed my life to Jesus, is it only about healing? Because I believe in miracles and Jesus healed. I have seen him doing the same thing in my lifetime as well. Others with myself. Is it only for these things? Is there more to the power of the cross? And how is that? Because the cross represents death. So when we talk about the power of the cross, we are not just talking about the new life the resurrection life we are also talking about the power of death and how does that work in the life of a believer listen please with me as i go on there is a message i will uh, a, a transcript of a message i've already passed it to others and they will uh, share it on the screen it is called dying to self we will look at that not now not now we will look at that later okay just 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 yeah you can put it aside we will do that later on I, I will I will um, let you know when all right so I don't want to uh, distract with all those words I, I want you to listen to what I'm saying um, and I pray that the Spirit of God the Spirit of wisdom and revelation and understanding will now come and grace our minds and our hearts so that we have ears to hear and eyes to see because I believe that this is an important message for us in the aspect of warfare this I believe addresses one of the big giants and now I'm talking about Goliath one of the giants of the South Indian region 
I believe we are beginning to address some of these things as I talk here. But before I go into the specifics of that, let me continue with my message here. That message is called dying to self. And of course we have baptism for those of us that have also um, made your own commitment to baptism, the waters of baptism. It is symbolic of us dying, dying to sin, dying to the old nature, dying to the things of the world, dying to things carnal. And when we come back up out of the water, it represents us coming to new life, the life of Christ, the resurrection life, so to speak. And so that baptism is itself symbolic, a public declaration that I have chosen of my own volition to die to sin, to die to the things of the world. And so we've got salvation and dying to sin where we repent. We've got baptism that the Lord has commanded us as well. We also have the elements of uh, the Last Supper where Jesus broke the bread. All right. And he says, do this whenever, you know, uh, remember when you do the, whenever you do this, all right, of the death of Jesus Christ. And there is an old, old uh, chorus. Okay. Will I be broken like bread to feed the hungry for you? Will I be poured out like wine? May I be so, will I be so one with you? This is the worship chorus to God. That I will do just as you would. Will I be light and life and love your words fulfill? Your ways fulfill? Am I willing to die beyond that first prayer of salvation of repentance? Beyond the waters of baptism? Beyond the breaking of bread that we love to do? Remembering what Jesus did. And I pray that that remembering would be to remember that we are to follow likewise. As disciples of Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. There's the scripture in Colossians chapter 2. And I'm going to read from verse 20 to 23. Colossians chapter 2, Paul writes to the church in Colossae. He says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. Now this word, this term elemental spirits, is a, I had to look it up myself. Elemental spirits... It doesn't, doesn't say too much. The best translation I find was uh, the ways of the world. The way the, the world does things. All right. So if with Christ you died to the way that the world does things, why, as if you were still alive to, in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used. Now, I am not against, I am not suggesting in my message all right, that we are to uh, flout regulations. Obviously, you know, when uh, my son was a little boy, if he was at that time, and he wanted to play um, Prince of Persia, and he wanted to use uh, the kitchen knives, obviously I would tell him, no, do not handle, do not touch, things like that, all right? So I don't mean that. I don't believe the word of God is saying that either, all right? According to human precepts and teachings. Human teachings, and I'll come to that later. All right. Especially those that have been inspired by the enemy. There is much good in human precepts and teaching. There is much good in culture, which is also God-inspired, I believe. Because the Bible clearly says that Every nation, tribe, and tongue, every culture will be represented as we worship God together in heaven. So I'm not against that. However, there are human precepts and teachings that are non-biblical. I will explain a little bit later. Verse 23 says, These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism. And severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. They are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. It starts with saying, if with Christ you died to the way the world does things. So why then do we go into all these human precepts and teachings which have an appearance of wisdom, 
but they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. I have summarized these few verses to the critical parts. We have died with Christ. Is it possible that we can die even today? My answer is yes. And I will explain that. So here we have Paul writing and says, if you have died, they are of no value. The things that we have tried now in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. I would like to suggest that as far as the indulgence of the flesh goes, we need to die. We need to die to the indulgence of the flesh. I will explain. And that's why we have, when I talked in my first message on open up at lockdown, all right? That was uh, taken from another passage of scripture, if my people who are called by my name, all right, the part that I uh, chose to speak on was seek my face. And seeking God's face was the same as seeking his character, not for the character sake, not that we might be mature, although that happens, not that we might become a little bit more like Jesus, although that does happen. Not necessarily even that we might be changed from glory to glory, even into the image of Christ. Although that also will happen. But we seek after his face purely for the sake of God himself. Relationship with God. And likewise, in stopping the indulgence of the flesh, we choose to die to the flesh. We, to, we choose to die to the indulgence. Just because of God. Not for maturity, not for growth, although those things will happen. That's God's work. And it requires faith as well as works. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And yet faith without works is dead. Our part is the dying part. That's what we are supposed to do. In that warfare, in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So we have started as we have died to Christ. And so when we talk about forgiveness, all right, um, earlier on when we were doing the first season of uh, Open Up at Lockdown, there were so many questions. I was privileged to hear the message on forgiveness. And uh, people were struggling with forgiveness. Well, forgiveness also carries the cross. Because in order to forgive someone that has truly hurt us, deeply wounded us, it means that we have to die to our own anger. We have to die to our own bitterness. We have to die to the sense of injustice done to us. We have to die to the hurts that are within us. Not only does God heal that, but we have to give it up. And only when we die to that and give it up, let go of it that then God can bring the healing. We have to die to the thoughts of revenge against the person that hurt us, sinned against us. Thoughts of retribution, the attitude of tit for tat. And what does it look like? It looks something like this. He didn't take my call. Well, wait, the next time he calls, I am not going to answer that call. He didn't reply to my email until after three days. The next time he writes to me, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to wait four days. Let him wait. Let him sweat. It's a tit for tat attitude. There is no forgiveness. So yes, as we seek God, we seek to be more forgiving. But that forgiveness becomes harder when we hold on to the hurt. We hold on to the bitterness. And all along, the words, the war of words, the enemy will be speaking lies into our minds. And there I use the words, I said, the, the voices. Some of you had questions about that, the voices in our head. All right, there are three voices. Basically, there are three voices. There's God's voice, whether he chooses to speak through um, uh, uh, music, a message, Zoom, uh, physical church, whether he speaks through, through, uh, speak through a donkey, whether he chooses to speak through an angel, a revelation, a dream, whatever. God speaks to us. The second voice is that of Satan's. Whether it's temptation, whether it's the enemy, whether it's demons, whether it's uh, 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 media, whether it's newspaper, whether it's whatever it is. A peer, a friend, your boss that said something, your spouse. Enemy can speak. Whether it's a situation, 
Second voice is Satan. The third voice is our own voice, our own thoughts, our own memories. What we choose to think, our worldview, so to speak, what we believe to be true. What we believe to be the conclusion to a certain event. Those are our thoughts. And there's three voices. And so when I talk about the voices, okay, what I have been talking about is the voices of the past, our memories, authority figures speaking into our lives. I will make a, 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 a few um, a, a more specific um, examples of that. But let's go on. All right. So we have chosen to seek the Lord, but it also means that we must die to something. Whether we choose humility, and so yes, we say, God, I want to grow in humility, but it means that I must die to, 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 to pride. Choosing humility, to be humble, means that I might have to choose to die to a position, choose to die to being acknowledged, choose to die to be credited with something that we did maybe, choose to die to a status that we think we hold. The thought will come is, who does he think he is? Choose to die to whatever education or experience we might have, the knowledge that we think we have. Even dying to the right to be right is choosing humility. So these things of the Lord, as we seek the Lord, is not just reaching out for the Lord and something that he has. But it also means I must die to something within myself so that my hand is then free as I let go of these things. I have died to these things. Now God can fill me. The last time I talked about David, he had to die to his thoughts of possibly self-pity. My father doesn't love me. He doesn't value me. Doesn't consider me his family. He doesn't love me enough. Possibly he's ashamed of me. That's a big one. Many of us keep quiet because we think someone is ashamed of me. David had to die to the abuse of his brothers. The bitterness that was there, the anger that was there, the false accusation was there. He had to die to those thoughts, to the hurt. He had to die to thoughts of not being good enough when his leader, King Saul, said, you are not able to go against Goliath. He had to war against the words of the enemy when Goliath yelled at him. I made a mistake in that previous uh, message. It was Goliath says, you come, you think I am a dog. He didn't call him a dog. He says, you think I am a dog. You come and fight me against, against me with sticks and stones. But he had to fight against that and die to that and focus on God. See, Satan is considered to be a roaring lion. All right. And it is there in 1 Peter chapter 5. And verse 8 says, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Not a biting lion, not a tearing lion, not necessarily a destroying lion, not a cutting lion. A roaring lion. Noise. Words. Along those lines. A roaring lion. The problem is whenever the enemy roars, we get all afraid. And now there is a saying that we have in Youth with the Mission. It says, don't react, respond. Enemy would love to have us re react. And so when I, for I forget uh, uh, myself in a situation and the boss yells at me, I react back with something, a retort that later on I regret. A roaring lion. But so let, let's look a little bit more about this here. All right. In verse 5 it says. 
Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Submission. It says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. Um, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I've already talked about the humility part of it. It means we must die to whatever thoughts of being the elder. Die to being male, possibly, when I'm speaking to a female member. Possibly I have to die uh, because I think I'm so much more qualified, so much more educated, so much more experienced. Here it says younger, but it doesn't say uh, younger in other parts of scripture. It says submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. But the whole idea of submission also means that I must die to myself in order that I might submit to someone else. Verse 6 continues, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him. Now, when these words come back, when we remember these things that have been spoken over us, anxiety comes upon me, stress comes upon me. When the boss yells at me, stress comes upon me. There is anxiety. When there's a situation that is out of my control, anxiety comes upon me. When I step out of the road now and I'm worried about the coronavirus, anxiety, stress comes upon me. When someone says, you have done wrong, anxiety comes upon me. When someone says, you need to change your ways, anxiety comes upon me. It is not just the anxiety of what we eat and what we wear and Jesus says, yes, God, you know, will take care of those things. Anxiety and stress comes in so many ways. You will all agree anxiety and stress comes whenever someone says this is wrong or someone comes to correct you. Is it not so? Casting all your anxiety on God, on him because he cares for you. Not just to heal but to also assist you in dying to those anxieties whatever it is. For the devil it says, be sober-minded, be watchful. That's when it talks about the devil, prowling around like a roaring lion. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The last time I spoke, someone had a question. You know, um, what do you tell, you know, uh, uh, someone that has just been uh, humiliated or, or in a negative word spoken? All right. And... Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, not that one. All right, this is the other one, okay? When someone uh, 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 wrongly, unjustly rebukes you, yells at you, okay, what do you do? One of the, the things I reminded this uh, person of was that remember, this other person could be suffering more than you, could be hurting more than you. The scripture talks about it. Resist the enemy, it says. Resist Satan. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Others are also going through difficulties. We are all in this together. And our warfare is not against flesh and blood. Against principalities and powers. And so the enemy is the roaring lion. Seeks to bring fear. Fear of what people might say. Fear of what people might think. Fear of what society would say. What our culture would say. What our culture dictates. I need to follow to the T. Not necessarily. One example of that is a friend of mine, a missionary pastor, just recently died of a sickness. It wasn't Corona. Something that he'd been ailing with for a long time. And um, there were a lot of people that tried to raise funds for him. In the end, he found that it wasn't enough. His daughter was going to get married and he borrowed money for the wedding. Soon after which, he passed on to glory. Leaving behind his mother and his daughters to carry the debt. Why? Because culture dictates that when you have a wedding, it must be so big, it must be so grand, you must have this, you must have that. And despite funds being raised to help him, 
he went into debt. We only found out about this after he passed away. And now his wife and his daughters are left holding his debt. There are some parts of uh, culture that will be represented in heaven. I don't believe this will be. There will not be any marrying up in heaven. But what I'm trying to say is this. There are parts of culture that we do not need to follow. But if culture speaks so loud into your mind that you are not able to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then I believe that part of culture we must die to. Let it go. Despite what people say, despite what culture say, despite what the greater tribe would say, despite what leaders say, friends, despite what the enemy says, and the enemy would love to bring fear. Would love to bring fear. Oh, society is never going to accept you after that. Am I waiting for society to say, well done, good and faithful servant? Oh, I'm waiting, waiting for my Father in Heaven to say, well done, good and faithful servant. It is the fear of society that bends me to do things that the enemy would love to see me. Are we concerned about the gossip that goes around? We don't have to worry about gossip. God is more concerned about our reputation than we are. Not that we should be concerned about our reputation, let me say. But if we conduct ourselves righteously, then we have nothing to fear. I'm reminded of this one example. I used to teach um, in a school. All right? And there was this one time that uh, one of the students, he was so obnoxiously rude to one of my teachers. And I spoke to him strictly, sternly. I said, I will spank you so hard. He went back home. Well, of course, I added a few more adjectives. Nothing vulgar though. I will not do that. But basically, that was the tone of my voice. That was the, the, the summary of my message. He went back and he reported back to his parents in the hearing of another family whose children are also in the school I was working in. I don't know who recounted this situation to me, but this other parent simply said this. She said, Sir Ian doesn't talk like that. And that was the end of the matter. He put a slant on it. Not exactly a vulgar slant, although it could be taken as a vulgar slant to that. All right. I said I would spank you so hard you won't be able to sit properly for the next week. That's more specifically what I said. All right. I'll leave you to guess what kind of uh, sl a slang he might have used. And the other parent simply said, Sir Ian doesn't talk like that. I have learned not to. I had to die to my own thought my own idea of getting back at my friends when I was that age when I would have used slang. I had to die to those things. I will not use those words. So, just quickly continuing on. Mega, what time do I finish the message? I am 15 minutes over time, am I? You can go to late 30 and then Q&A. No, 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 no. Q&A starts what time? 8.30. 8 you have 13 minutes more for that. 8.30. Q&A starts 8.30. Okay, so I have uh, maybe, what, 12 minutes left. Okay, good. I'm trying to explain the problem here, the things that we have to die to, otherwise it just becomes so abstract. And I realize, yes, these are things that I have thought of for years now, all right? And which is also one of the reasons, continuing on with my message, one of the reasons why we don't like to say, I don't know. Whenever we ask a question, we, we, we don't like to say, I don't know. When I first came to Chennai, I would go on the roads, I would be looking for a certain building, a certain address. People just would not say, 
I don't know. Please check with someone else. Why is it? Because back in the, in, in, in the back of their minds, they probably heard words like, why don't you know? Why are you so stupid? How come you didn't learn? All the other words that come with the, 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 the answer, I don't know. There's nothing wrong with saying I don't know, except that we as believers struggle to say I don't know because the voices are still speaking, the memories are still there. We don't even ask questions. Why? Because the teacher most likely would have said, why is it you asking me a question? You're not doing your homework. Go back home, study your, 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 your textbook well and come tomorrow. And she doesn't answer the question. Meanwhile, we are left with a sense of shame, embarrassment. And the next time someone asks a question, we do not want to try to uh, at attempt an answer because we are afraid we are wrong. Because whenever we are wrong, the railing comes again. The words come out again, putting us down. And therefore, we don't want to say, I don't know. We also don't try to uh, attempt to answer the question. These are examples. All right, of the words that go on behind us. There's a saying that this one pastor said one time when I was speaking, to, when, when he was speaking at a message, he said, the enemy knocked on the door, faith answered, and there was nobody there. The enemy knocked on the door, faith answered, and there was nobody there. What if fear answers the door? You would see the enemy. What if anxiety answers the door? What if insecurity answers the door? What if self-pity answers the door? What if fear of man answers the door? Doubts, frustration, anger, vengeance, pride, tradition, culture answers the door. The enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. No wonder we, you know, last message I said I opened my mouth often and I put my foot into it. I'm sure you have done the same thing, all of us. None of us is perfect. We would have all done the same. And we find that there are certain triggers that keep coming back because the enemy knows what our trigger is and keeps bringing these things back so that we react, we react, and we end up saying, why did I do that again? And then we reinforce our own lies by saying, I am so stupid. I am so worthless. I am good for nothing. I will never be able to do anything right. Or maybe we try and, uh, and, and things like the, the power of positive thinking determination, self-will. And these things are the ways of the world. They have an appearance of victory. But what does the Bible tell us? For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if I live, I live to Christ. And if I die, and I die to these anxieties, insecurities, fear of man, doubts, frustrations, anger, pride, if I die to, to, to uh, these things, well then for me to die is gain. Because I don't gain necessarily, although in the long term I do, it is the kingdom of God. Not that my reputation is intact. Not that I have grown my maturity, but that the kingdom of God has been extended. But that God has received the glory. Unless we die, there is no resurrection. Some of us are familiar with the words resurrection life, resurrection power. Well, there can be no resurrection if there is no death. And if we die to pride, there will be a resurrection of humility. If we die to anxiety, there will be the resurrection of peace. If we die to unforgiveness, there will be that resurrection of forgiveness. That's God's work. Only God can do that. And we are reminded that it is not by power, it is not by might, by God's Holy Spirit. And so it is not determination, self-will, positive thinking, it is not skill, it is not practice, it is not education. It is by faith in the Word of God. And we need those words. Because in my message when I spoke on David and Goliath, I said, the enemy is shouting so loud. Pride is shouting so loud. 
self pity is shouting so loud anger is shouting so loud we cannot hear god's voice and so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god it is both the logos and the rhema that is why it's so important for us not just the word because remember even satan knows the word i believe in the word of god i read the word of god i study the word of god i speak from the word of god i examine my life in the context of the word of god but just the word of god without the relationship of god speaking to us giving us understanding i am reminded that even satan knows the word of god and still he is satan but god's word with his spirit of wisdom and understanding and we need understanding to be able to understand what is going on the questions are left with you some of them were what am i thinking that was in the last message on david and goliath why did i do what i do self examination in the light of god's word in the light of god's spirit trusting his logos and his rema and so by faith in god and his word because his word is a lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path he will teach us and so luke 9 verse 23 this is also mentioned in matthew it is also mentioned in mark however luke has one more word he says if anyone would come after me let him take up his cross daily luke adds the word daily take up his cross daily and follow me that's the way of the cross it is we who must take up our cross daily not just when i um gave my heart to jesus not just symbolic when i went into the waters not just you know the the, the the breaking of bread but daily dying to these things which is also why i chose that uh, uh recommended that song that that small chorus i have decided to follow jesus the cross before me the world behind me again the perspective is relationship with god because often times you know the the motives are so the heart is so desperately wicked so desperately wicked the bible says and so often i find that even sometimes i'm preparing my message and the motive behind that message is that my message is appreciated as against god's kingdom is expanding as against god's kingdom is established a little further maybe one more step so the perspective is not the victory that i might get the maturity the teaching i've talked about these things for those of us that are preachers you know sometimes the perspective you know can be big congregations large followings for others of us who are not necessarily preachers we may be looking at you know x number of uh, uh, likes on the facebook page so what about those likes what about the kingdom of god is that advancing what about relationship with god that always has to be the focus and so the dying is not necessarily for myself although that will happen the dying is that god may live for me to live is christ to die is gain next 3 minutes i will be wrapping up but some biblical examples how is it possible that jesus dying on the cross could pray this prayer and say father forgive them they don't know what they are doing very recently um i had a tiff with my wife i was so upset with her until i remember these words this is just a few days ago yes at my age these things still happen we are not devoid of these things are we temptation all manner of evil that the enemy will throw at us and i was so upset i was so angry in my mind there were so many things that i wanted to do to to work out that anger some of them were not good and godly things and when i remember that i prayed father forgive her she doesn't know what she is doing i died to that anger 
I died to that hurt. Release forgiveness. It was gone. Thoughts of further action, positive, negative action, gone. I was able to continue life, whatever I was doing. How could David in the cave of Adullam refrain himself from killing uh, King Saul? All he did was destroy Saul's court. And in that point in history, in that point in time, if he had raised his hand and killed Saul, he would have become king. Fulfillment of his anointing. It would have happened immediately. How could David have not raised the sword? How could Paul immediately apologize in Acts chapter 23 when he found out that who he called the whitewashed wall was actually the high priest? There was stress involved in all of these. How could David give up his throne when Absalom caused stress by rebelling and declaring himself as king? And David could have picked up his army chased after uh, uh, Absalom, killed of all of the followers and left Absalom alone. He could have done that. But he chose to remove himself and said, I will die to this uh, idea of being king. And if my time is gone, then let God choose whoever will sit on that throne. That is dying to self. How is it possible that Joseph could endure so much injustice and still forgive? He died to those things, died to thoughts of revenge, of self-pity, bitterness, anger, frustration. How could a Canaanite woman accept insult from Jesus and still ask for help and say, but don't the dogs also eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table? Oh, she could have gone away upset and angry and had good reason to, being called a dog. And yet we find examples of how people overcame that. Hebrews 4, and I will end of this. It's already 8.30. Hebrews 4. And I'm going to look at uh, verse 11 to 16. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Because death is rest. And so when people pass on, like my friend, this pastor who passed on recently, you know, we, we, we say the words, may my brother rest in peace. It is a rest, it is entering home. But there is rest even here on earth from all the stress and all the anxiety, the anger that plagues us, the anxiety that plagues us, the uncertainty. All of the things that the enemy throws at us, that is also rest and the Bible invites us. Therefore, therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. When someone shouts at me in anger, my first reaction is to shout back in anger. There is no rest and I have fallen by the same sort of disobedience. When someone doesn't pick up my call and it might be that he or she was busy, I immediately presume it to be igno ignoring me and I say next time I am not going to pick up that call. I am falling by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions, the motive of the heart. What I'm talking about are thoughts and motives. Those are the voices that we hear. I'm not talking about the voices that we think we are hearing, like one man heard the voices, thought it was God, and wrote a whole book about it. I'm not talking about those things. I'm not talking about those who wake up in the middle of the night and, and say, I heard a, 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 a voice. Now, God can speak like that, but these are different. I'm talking about thoughts, intentions of the heart, the echoes, the memories, our own conclusions that we believe to be true. Verse 13, no creature is hidden from his, his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Enter that rest, careful that we do not fall by the same sort of disobedience because the word of God is that two-edged sword 
discerning the thoughts and intentions. I pray that the word of God, as you look at it, not as the word, not as study necessarily, although, although those are good, but in relationship with God, allow the rhema word of God to come to you as well. So that your thoughts and your intentions are exposed, that you might die to them, then live the resurrection life. Because when you die, like I said, to insecurity, security is resurrected. When you die to anger, peace comes. When you die to bitterness, forgiveness comes. That is God's work. That is the faith part. But the works part means the way of the cross. Dying to self. Um, could you just put on that uh, passage quickly? Um, I will read just one or two of them and then quickly close that down because it's already 34. This is, if anyone wants it, please check with Mega and uh, she will get this to you. This is not mine. Credit is given there to Paul King. When you are forgotten or neglected, purposely set at naught, you don't sting and hurt with the insult or the oversight, but your heart is happy, being counted worthy to suffer for Christ. That is dying to self. When your good is evil spoken of, when your wishes are crossed, your advice disregarded, your opinions ridiculed, and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart or even defend yourself, but take it all in patient, loving stride, that is dying to self. When you lovingly and patiently bear any disorder, any irregularity, any annoyance, when you stand face to face with waste, folly, extravagance, spiritual insensitivity, and endure it as Jesus endured it, that is dying to self. Every one of these is so loaded with teaching for us. Areas that we might consider as we examine ourselves in the light of God's word. Allowing the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. Could you close that please? That is available for anyone who wants it. In fact, Mega, you can put it on that WhatsApp as an attachment. Let them all have it. My heart this evening, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that we grow one step closer in our relationship with the Lord Jesus. If we find, I'm not talking about just growth for growth's sake, but for relationship with God. And remember I said this is, I believe, one of the giants that we're beginning to face. I believe this is one of the giants. When you come at me with anger and I, try, and I react back with anger, I am trying to control you and the situation. When I wallow in self-pity because someone said I was no good, I am trying to control the situation. I am trying to control my emotions. I am trying to control things. Whereas if I die to that, let God take control. Casting my cares on Him, my anxiety on Him, because He cares for us. When I give in to all these so-called good things of culture and I find that I get into a mess when simple word of God says don't, I find myself in a mess. It is the strong man, it is the Goliath, not the words. But we must die to those words so that I might stand up for what is right and say, I will trust God because he is my provider. I don't need to do the things that the world does, the ways of the world, the elemental spirits. I don't have to react. I can respond because of the spirit of God. Because I know what it is I'm wrestling with. God has spoken to me. He has shared with me. It helps when you talk to someone and pray with someone. On your own, you are isolated. You become an easy target. Let me pray with you right now as we close. I'm seven minutes over time. Father, I pray for the spirit of understanding and wisdom to be upon all of us. Those that will hear this message, even in the days to come. I pray, Father God, that this message of dying, the cross, not just in salvation or baptism or the breaking of bread, but daily we would take up a cross, Lord, knowing that you and you alone have the power of life and resurrection and that you will not forsake us, but that you will be with us always. 
resurrecting us when we choose to die, to die to the things of this world. And so I pray that blessing upon each one of us, Lord, and those that will be here. Those that will be hearing this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.